For this year's Memorial Day, Independence Day, I want to tell you guys a story. It's basically the story of Israel encapsulated by my own personal story and the story of Efrat, the town that me and my family live in here in the beautiful hills of Gush Etzion. So, just a number of decades ago, not that long ago, because I remember it, and I'm not that old, these were the hills of Gush Etzion. All of them, barren hills, without Jews living here. Why? Because we were expelled and removed from our homes by the Jordanians back in 1948 that destroyed all the Jewish communities, took the remaining Jewish soldiers into captivity, and whoever survived ended up moving out and living in Jerusalem. So these are the barren hills of Gush Etzion. This is how these hills looked when me and my family came here for a special event back in the summer of 1980, the groundbreaking ceremony for the first Jewish city to be built once again in the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people, these Judean hills here in Gush Etzion. That was back in 1980. Let's continue on with the story. Before I begin to tell you of how this story begins in 1980, I want to take a few steps backwards, a few thousands of years, like 2,000 plus years. Because in this area, 2,000 plus years ago, my ancestors used to use this ritual bath. This is a mikvah here in the hills of Gush Etzion. In the middle of nowhere? Well, obviously back then it was the middle of somewhere. And here on the path of the patriarchs, because the Jews used to walk on this path that connected Jerusalem and Shiloh and Beit El and Bethlehem and Hebron and Beersheba. And anytime Jews used to walk from the south, from Hebron or Beersheba area to Jerusalem, they used to stop here and go into a ritual bath to be ritually cleansed before they enter Jerusalem. And then for 2,000 years, after exile and persecution after persecution, hardly any Jews lived here. There always was a Jewish presence, but very, very few. Until the modern era, Jews came back. Thousands of years later, the year is 1980, and my family and I get on a bus in Jerusalem, and we get off here at this intersection. But in 1980, this was a dirt road. Those, that's a four lane highway today. There were hardly any cars there. Dirt road over here. And then we walked and walked and walked up this dirt path in order to get into the hilltop over there of Efrat. But at the time, the hilltop was barren. There was nothing there. We were little kids. We walked for like an hour, massive amount of people, masses of people walking, walking, walking straight here, making a left into Efrat and then walking along the long, long dirt path all the way to the one single structure that existed there, which was for a yeshiva and a place set up for a ceremony, the official groundbreaking ceremony of Efrat. This is where we walk to for the ceremony, for that special groundbreaking ceremony for the beginning of the building of the city of Efrat. This building wasn't here. There was a structure here that re represented a yeshiva, that this structure is now that yeshiva. But at the time, there was nothing here. These were barren hills. And the street here that you see right before me, this was a path. A, this was a dirt path that the masses all walked down in a dirt path all the way here to come and enjoy the historic moment for the groundbreaking ceremony for this new city of Israel, the first Jewish city in the Judean hills for thousands of years to be named Ephrat. Who knew back then in 1980 that 
10 years later, me and my family would be living here. We certainly had no clue. It was somewhere around here on this barren hill. There was a stage and there were politicians and people involved in the building up and resettling of the Jewish people in the Gush Etzion, right around here. Totally barren hills, nothing. All they had was a vision that one day there was gonna be a city of Efrat built on these hills. And we are all grateful for the fact that that city now exists. And who knew I would be at the groundbreaking ceremony and living in this city one day. Fast forward to March 1983, and the first families move into Efrat. The first two communities are the Teina and the Rimon, two separate hills. Behind me is the Rimon community with all of the houses and infrastructure. And here on the side of me is the Teina community with stores, educational institutions, and homes of all the families who live here as well. So here we are at the famous Pizzeria Efrat. That's the pizza place here in Efrat. It was established back at the beginning, and I remember sitting here at this pizza place back in 1985, coming here with my family, visiting Israel once again, and this time enjoying Marvin's Pizza. Marvin was the person who established the pizza place, and he moved here with Rabbi Riskin at the beginning in 1983 when Efrat was established. And today, my son works at the pizza place. Talk about the circle of life. Fast forward again. The year is 1990. My family lives in Baltimore, Maryland after I grew up in New York City. My father is the principal of a high school in Baltimore. And it came to a time when he was ready for his next step in life. And he and my mother decided, you know what? We're not gonna move to Los Angeles where they want my father as a principal. We're not gonna move to Tennessee where they want my father as a principal. We're not gonna move to any other place in America. The time has come for us to move back home to Israel. And when I say back, even though I was born in New York City, even though both of my parents were born in New York City, Israel is home. Israel is where our ancestors are. And it was on this street, on the Geffen community, just down the hill from the Teina and Rimon communities, the third hilltop to be built and developed here in Efrat, this is where we made our home when we rented a home when we first made Aliyah and returned home to Israel. When we lived on this street in the Geffen community back in 1990 to 1993, this was a dead-end street, but this was the end of Efrat. There was no more Efrat. Like you know, I was here in Efrat when there was nothing for the grand barking ceremony. Then back in 1985 to look at the building in the Teina and the Rimon communities, and then I lived in the Geffen community. That was it, just three hilltops in Efrat, and there was nothing, barren hills. Well. Let's see what we have today. A year after my family moved to Efrat and we lived in the Geffen community, plans were announced that a new hilltop was gonna be built up, the community hilltop of Dekel. And there was a lottery for families to be able to bid for the right to win a lot of land and build a home. And my family decided, you know what? Let's go for it. We're happy, we've had a year here. This is a nice place to live. We're happy living in Israel. And my family, my parents, joined the lottery. Hundreds and hundreds of families from all over the land of Israel joined the lottery and there were only like 25 lots that they would then be built up as private homes. For, so you could win the right to buy the lot and then build a home. Thankfully, my parents won. We won one of the 20 some odd options of land to then be able to build our own home in the land of Israel. So we started building a home and we started working with the architect, and then we started working with the builders, and we watched with our own eyes a place of nothing be built up into a beautiful home that we ourselves developed and built in our ancestral homeland of Israel. 
And after these 20 or so buildings were built in this beautiful community right here in the Dekel, then as we moved in years later, after our house was built, we then saw the whole Dekel community be built up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of housing units, some private, some buildings, some apartments. I remember going biking and watching all the building going on on both sides of me as I would be biking down the streets of a developing community of Efrat. Since we were basically founding members of this new community in the land of Israel and in this specific neighborhood of the Dekel in Efrat, this is the synagogue right down the block that we helped found and build and be a part of developing. And I can't tell you how exciting it is to take part in building up the land of Israel. For thousands of years, our ancestors dreamt of being able to live in the land of Israel, of being able to escape the horrors and persecution of country after country and evil and evil rule, rulers after evil rulers and evil kingdoms and, and evil governments. And finally, our generation, we're able to do it. We're living the dream of thousands of years of our ancestors. How blessed are we? The year is now 1995. And while up until now, everything sounded so nice and peachy and idyllic in terms of building up our homeland and building new communities in the land of Israel, specifically our community of Efrat, it wasn't always so easy. Sometimes it was actually really, really hard. The challenges were tremendous. In 1995, the Rabin government was in charge here in Israel. The Rabin government was against building homes for Jews in Judea and Samaria. Not just against building, they actually stopped us from building. The government stopped giving permissions for building. The government stopped even allowing caravans to be placed for future building. And I'm going to tell you about the story of the Zayats. Because I remember one night, we all of a sudden all got phone calls. This is 1995, no mobile phones, no text messaging, nothing. We all got phone calls saying, everyone, everyone go up to the Zayat Hill at like two in the morning. Okay, there's nothing built on the Zayat Hill. It was a new community that was planned to be built, right? There was, it was, it was a plan for hundreds and thousands of residents to live on the Zayat community one day. And that was the beginning of trying to get it started in 1995. Everyone be on the Zayed Hill, the Barren Hill at two o'clock in the morning. Why? Because they were bringing caravans to go around the army roadblocks and escape the Israeli army jeeps and the government enforcement to stop those caravans from getting to Efrat to be brought to the Zayed Hill. And I remember coming up to this hill, this Barren Hill at two o'clock in the morning and we welcomed those trucks with caravans that began the establishment over the challenges of our own government that was doing everything to stop us from building more homes in our community. And today, this shopping center is at the place where the first caravans were placed that night in 1995, where me and my fellow Efratians came to welcome the trucks for those caravans. And today, the Zayat is a big developed community with thousands of families and lots of private homes and lots of buildings. But that's not the only challenge we had to develop Efrat. The Rabin government of 1995 wasn't just against Jews building homes in our ancestral homeland here in the Judean Hills here in Gush Etzion. At that same time period, the Rabin government was involved in talks with legitimizing the terrorist group, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, and legitimizing them to be a government that would then be called the Palestinian Authority. So the Israeli government, the Rabin government, made a deal. And that deal would be giving away land, Jewish land, our ancestral homeland here in the Judean Hills, giving it to the Palestinian Authority for it to be part under their authority instead of Israel. Some of that land was municipal land of Efrat, including a hilltop called Dagan. 
the people of Ephrat were furious, but there were some people who actually took action to try to stop the Rabin government from giving this land away to the terrorists, Palestinian Liberation Organization. And those were a number of women, a number of women, wives, mothers of Efrat, even though they had kids, little kids at the time, today all grown up, back then they were little kids. They packed up and almost every night they came out to the Dagan Hill in tents and protesting and the government would send police and army to take them down off the hills and the woman would come back and we had special events up on the Dagan Hill and there was no road, there were no paths. There was a barren hill next to the existing communities of Efrat. I remember one night when the army and police came to take all of the women off of the hill, Rabbi Riskin was taken off to jail. My mother was taken off to jail. She was one of those women. Many women who I know were taken off to jail. And my brother as well was one of those people up on that hill. Today, this hill, the community of Dagan, is built up with hundreds of homes with Jewish families living here. It wasn't easy and it wouldn't have happened had those women not been active in stopping the Rabin government from giving away our municipal land. If they would have not protested, if they would have not organized all those marches and sit-ins and sleep-ins in those tents away from their homes. They had homes in the other areas of Afrat and they camped out here to try to save the land of Israel. And they did. And they did. And today we have the community of Dagan, thanks to those women and all of the people who protested against the Rabin government and their plans to give away land to the Palestinian Liberation Organization, terrorist organization, it's known today as the Palestinian Authority. Unfortunately, the Rabin government did give away a lot of land in Judea and Samaria, and it's up to us still today to try to save every piece of land we can because they try to do a legal building and they, they try to plan to whatever they can with billions of dollars of funding from the European Union. So this the struggle for the land of Israel still goes on today. But that's not the end of my personal story witnessing the miraculous developments of this Jewish, modern Jewish city of Efrat. We got one more story to tell. And there, right behind me, is the Dagan community today, all built up. It wasn't built as a permanent community until just two years ago, but for many years it had a caravan community up there. Now to the last story. The last story is the story of the Zayat community. Even though the Dagan and the Tamar were built last, I'm ending with the Zayat. This is where I live today. After I finished the army, after I got married, after I went to college, my wife and I wanted to find a place to live here in the land of Israel. And we chose the community of Ephrat. This is the year 2001. The year 2001, there was a very tiny Zayed community. It was mostly all being built at the time. And today, buildings and buildings and houses and houses. It is the largest community in Efrat today. But more exciting than that is as my children were born and growing up, they used to sit on our porch watching the roads being built below, the buildings being built below. With their own eyes, they have their own story of witnessing the development and the resettlement of the Jewish people in their ancestral and internal homeland. Those buildings, they watched being built. Those roads, they watched being built. We used to have snowball fights on those roads down below years ago when they were kids. Those communities over there, they watched being built. That community over there, my kids watched being built. We are just a microcosm of the bigger story of the miraculous return of the Jewish people to rebuild, resettle our ancestral and eternal homeland. We are so blessed. So to give you a quick recap, 1980, I witnessed the groundbreaking ceremony of Efrat. 1985, I witnessed the first 
two southern communities of Rimon and Teina and enjoyed the pizza place where my son works today. 1990, my family moves to Israel and we live in the new Geffen community. And then I watch the Dekel community being built up and my family moves out to live in the Dekel community. Then I get married and I live in the Zayat community. Today my parents moved out and live in the Zayat community and I have other family members in the Zayat. And then my family watched the Tamar being built and the Dagan being built and now we have family members there as well. This is the story of the return of the exiles. We are living the prophecies of the prophets. We are so blessed. I hope you enjoyed my personal story of Israel and witnessing with my own eyes the development of Israel up to this day. I wanted to end not on homes and not on communities. I wanted to end at this tree because this tree symbolizes the return of the Jewish people, not just to Gush Etzion, to the Judean hills, but to all of Israel. You see, this is the tree that stood here before 1948, when the Jewish communities here in the Judean hills were destroyed by the Jordanians and all the Jews were either killed, taken as pre prisoners of war, or expelled and had to live in Jerusalem. And it was from miles away on different hilltops. The Jews who survived the Gush Etzion battles and their children used to stand on the hilltops and look and see this tree and say, one day, one day we're gonna return and resettle and build up our homes once again in the Judean hills. And after the miraculous Six Day War in 1967, that's exactly what happened. And the first community, a kibbutz of Kfar Etzion, was established here in Gush Etzion. And then as you experienced together with me, you saw the development of the city of Efrat, the first city of Gush Etzion. And then not only do we have the seven hilltops of Efrat, but then we also have Neve Daniel, and we have Alon Shvut, and we have Kfar Etzion, and we have Rosh Tzurim, and we have the another city of Beitar throughout this gorgeous area of the Judean hills. And once again, the place where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes used to walk, and where our ancestors used to walk and go into that ritual bath on their way of travels towards the holy city of Jerusalem. Today, tens and tens and tens of thousands of Jews live here once again. And as we enter the very emotional time period of Memorial Day, remembering our soldiers and terror victims, and then turning a page overnight, literally, and celebrating Israel Independence Day. We remember the goodness that God has done for us to bring us back as the sovereign in our ancestral and eternal homeland after 2,000 years of exile and persecution. And we must remember, folks, the existence of the Jewish people are proof in and of itself that God exists because under all the laws of logic and history, we should have been exterminated time after time after time. Yet we survived each and every time. And not only did we survive, today we are thriving in our homeland. And here, the existence of the state of Israel, that is the second proof that God exists. Because with all of our enemies and all of the wars and all the terror, we are still standing strong and thriving making our nation a light into the nations. So be inspired by the Jewish people, be inspired by the modern state of Israel, the third Jewish commonwealth. And if you're a Jew, come home and be part of this amazing miracle. We still have plenty of barren hills available to settle and establish and strengthen the modern Jewish state of Israel. Signing off for another special episode of The Pulse of Israel, this is Avi Abelo here in our eternal and ancestral homeland, the Judean hills of the land of Israel. Pulse of Israel on frontline videos from the Holy Land. Support our work by donating today.